Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. My guest is Brock Holloman, uh, an entrepreneur in the real estate space. They're currently based out of Florida. They're building a lot of really nice uh, product, mostly single family, small multifamily type rental products. So he's got a construction company. They're doing ground up and they're cranking them out, building houses in 68 days. He's got Holloman Capital Group is kind of a second company where he's investing their capital back into these projects and some other avenues. And then he's got MyNewRental.com, the property management company for all this because they'll build them, sell some of them. Um, to investors, and then they'll keep a lot of them at, in their own rental pool. So just a great entrepreneurial story. He started in high school mowing lawns and has kind of parlayed that into some wholesaling stuff and then into this company uh, or three companies, construction, property management, and, and the capital company. So tons of nuggets in there and building the company, hiring, managing people, processes, going through downturns, and the whole thing that we kind of expect to go through as entrepreneurs uh, I enjoyed it, and I think you will too. So we'll get into the interview here with uh, with Brock Holloman. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas-based real estate investment firm with a track record of transacting on several hundred million dollars of multifamily land and industrial deals throughout Texas. DJE's been in business for over a decade and is approaching 100 team members in San Antonio. To learn more about DJE, visit djetexas.com or the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode's also brought to you by apartmenteducators.com, a complete ecosystem for professionals to learn how to find, finance, and operate large multifamily properties for profit. You can get started with a free mini course and learn more at apartmenteducators.com or visit the link in the notes. Brock, hey, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. How are you, sir? Devin, thanks for having me, man. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be on. I'm great. How are you doing? Yeah, doing real good. Doing real good. Just getting the year kicked off here and uh, a lot of different projects going and hopeful about 2024. So, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, want to wanna dive in on, on you for our audience here, folks. You, you're out in Sarasota County, Florida, doing build to rent stuff, real estate entrepreneur. Want to dive in on all that. But how about some background, man? How'd you, you know... What, what brought you into real estate? What was your journey getting into it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thanks. So it started off in, in high school. Um, I had a lawn mowing business. So my, my average client wasn't like, you know, the, the Smiths next door. Um, it was more vacant property owned by the banks in foreclosure. Because yeah. during that time, um, as you probably remember, and everybody does, like it was, it was hell for real estate. So, you know, it was like 50% of the houses in America were vacant or, or boarded up or something. And, and the banks, yeah, as they were trying to get rid of those properties, they were just sitting there and, and, and going to hell. So one of the little things that we did was, uh, or I did was I had a little lawn mowing business and started off and had about 40 to 50 lawns to do for, for one bank. Um, and That's it, a good you know, line, right out of the gate. Yeah, that was because it's one client and that makes yeah. it easier. And, yeah. and that, that sort of mentality is kind of, I guess from that, that first little business deal has, has stuck with me throughout because, you know, the more transactions you can do with one client, the easier these transactions are going to be, the more trust you got. And, you know, you build a lot of rapport off of this kind of stuff. So as long as you do the right thing. So yeah, it started like that. So this is high school. And how'd you find this bank with 50, 50 projects to work on? Yeah. So it was just, it was a small local bank. Um, you know, my father was a builder and, Yep. I know that he banked with these guys, and, and anyway, I just would go in there. I remember them uh, helping me open my first uh, bank account, and it was with these guys as well. And um, and yeah, so he definitely probably a plug from my from my father if I went back and dug into the details hard enough. So wasn't like some some young high school kid has has got the smarts to to think of that right out of by himself. <laughs> so. But to that point, like use every advantage absolutely possible right i mean as an entrepreneur like you're looking for any advantage in any spectrum and if that's one of them that a card you're dealt rock and roll right get it done i couldn't agree more but at the time when you're young and you're young and ambitious and uh you want to you want to try your best to sort of 
prove it to yourself that you can do it on your own. Which, and yes. if I could go back in time, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have done that. You know, um, that's one Tell of the things. Because the lawn mowing in general, or or what do you mean? Oh, I meant really. I meant just as as you kind of evolve, like you know, the, the higher paying stuff. You know, each step you take, right? You, you get more eyes that look at you, and you know, and more sentences that are judgmental about whatever or how you got into the situation you're in. And you know, with my dad being a builder, we weren't we weren't a, we weren't you know the richest family, okay? We, but we weren't we definitely weren't poor by any means. Sure. We were yeah. a good middle class family. He, we were well taken care of and a you know a solid income coming in. Um, but at the same time, I wanted I, I knew I wanted to to make something good out of myself. And when I did, I just didn't want people to think, oh, he did it only because of this or only because of, you know, his father or is this yep. or whatever it is, you know, um, which yeah, better to be numb to those thoughts, I think. And like you just said, use every advantage that you can. But at the same time, it still made me strive hard individually. But you fall on your face a lot, a lot more often that way. So, yeah, I think about that for my kids. I'm kind of a first generation entrepreneur. Well, I guess my father wasn't <laughs> grandfather was, but I think about it for my kids. They're kind of coming up with this and I'm, I'm like, Hey, I want to give these kids a leg up or introductions, but they're also going to want to carve their own path. Right. So we'll kind of see how that plays out. Right. Yeah. You always want to feel like you earned it too. Absolutely. And it wasn't yep. given. Yep. So I, I mean, like, have you ever had a job? If you, that sounds like a pretty good first start in entrepreneurship. Did you ever go get a W2 job or was yeah. it? Yeah. Business. So I was in Memphis, and, and the, the grass didn't grow uh, all year round like it does here in Florida. Right. Um, so I, I was, yeah, definitely, I, like money is always what interested me, even in school. So yep. as much as I could make, the better I felt, um, even though I spent it like water back then. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I had a job at IHOP at the same time. So, okay. you know, if the summer months were there, and I had mow, lawn mows, lawns to mow or whatever, I would pull up to IHOP with my trailer on the back of my my car and and the lawn equipment still on there and then walk in with my blue apron um Love but it. yeah so that's where that was the first i guess that was the only real w2 job i had right well that's yeah that's a good one for the resume were you running crews on the on all these houses or was it just you just hitting them all it started off with me and i think they they given me you know i don't remember the exact number i think it was probably like 10 or 15 lawns at first and then i in school um I had like zero friends that were younger than me and I always hung out with the, the older crowd and maybe I was sort of like a party animal and they, they, they kind of like enjoyed the young guy that was around and right. that would do crazy stuff with them. Um, <laughs> but those guys, you know, they, they all could drive and stuff like that. Then like those first friends I had in high school, they started to graduate and some of them, you know, weren't, like I said, we were the party crowd. So it's not like everybody was going to Harvard. Um, so they were very, you know, open to, to working on my crew and going out to, um, mow these, these yards. And I'm glad you brought that up. Cause it's a funny story. I remember one day I'm sitting in math class and, um, Miss Franks, so if, if she ever hears this, you know, I love you, Miss Franks. You're one of the few that I remember. And she knew what I was doing. And back then, you know, if you, if you get caught texting in class, you're going, you're getting suspended or, or some, something like the, the cell phones were new back then. It, yeah. it pissed all the teachers off. Oh yeah. I don't know what it's like anymore. I'm sure texts go off every second. They have them. Like my kids have them. It's, I'm like, is it, you have that at school? Like, yeah, yeah. I have, it's no big deal now, huh? Not, yeah. Okay. Back then it was a huge deal. Like you didn't want to be caught with it. Yep. And she didn't care. Like she knew I had this little lawn mowing deal. And, um, I remember the banker called me up and he sounded pissed and asked me to come in there immediately. Um, and I'm in school, like in the middle of the day, I was like, okay. And anyways, I just grabbed my bag. I left Miss Franks's class, went downtown, met with the guy and he brings out this book of all these pictures. And this was, I guess my first real lesson of being a boss and, and trusting others so they showed me all these pictures. It was like a scrapbook of all these properties. And at the time, remember, I started like at 10 or 15 properties. Then we, we worked our way up to 45, something like this. It was a lot of them for, for a little kid. And the, the pictures were of half mowed yards or some yards that had like two strips going down it. And then everything else was super tall. And it was just one after the other. And that was the first time I had to fire people. And it was tough because these were like, these were supposed to be my friends that I trust and all that. So it was yeah. like 
friendship or 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 work or business. And that was the first time I was ever dealt that uh, you know that choice. Um, but that's what had to happen. So it was very disappointing. It is, and also dealt like a priceless lesson. I got to imagine, right? Do what now? A priceless lesson that you know. Oh you yeah. Figure that out at some point. So. Yeah, we're here 13, 14, 15 years later, I think. And yeah, yep. and I still remember that. Yeah, that was the first, probably the first lesson in business. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think now about hiring, you know, for, and friends and kind of relationships there? You know, what do you have a philosophy or are you just kind of hiring people as needed for the company? What's your. Well, so we've got a few people that are that are family members in the company yep. right now. But yep. we've had and, and, you know, that first lesson made me, I guess, more numb and, and I guess sort of like a callus over yep. the, the feeling side of things. And if you ask the family member, family members that are in the business, they'll tell you that I'm a difficult person to be around when it comes to that very hard on them. And there's no, and I'm probably actually harder on the family members or the people that are closer to me in the business than I am, you know, the people that we hired in the last six months. Um, and it's just because I, you know, the closer that they are to me, I feel like there should be a more attention, more focus, more effort on things. Um, just to, just to, just because you care, you know? Right. Um, but I have definitely, I, if I had the option to, to hire Jim that has, you know, a great, great resume or Joe, who's my friend, who's got an even better resume, I would def, I would always probably lean towards Jim with the lesser resume and I just I just don't want that and it's not like I don't like working with my friends or anything like that I think that would make work more fun but I'm afraid to jeopardize those kind of relationships I don't have a ton of friendships and what I do have is meaningful to me and I don't want to do much to jeopardize that kind of stuff yeah it's such a fine line to walk and I, I agree with that it's uh but I think being in business with each other would be that's sort of a little different way to to think of it, maybe as long as somebody can bring in their role and responsibilities and be different and better than what you can bring to the table, you know? Yep. 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 Yeah. Partnerships a little bit different, maybe. Um, so how, what was, you know, you grew up obviously with a, with a father that was in, in real estate and building homes. What was your sort of first four way foray into real estate? Um, you know, when you kind of start maybe thinking about investments or, or those kinds of things, what was your on-ramp there? Right. Okay. So, so yeah, my, so my father, hundred percent genius, uh, on the construction side and all of this. And at the time when, when the, the lawns were being mowed, I remember him saying something, he had met a guy that was doing auctions, foreclosure auctions, um, in Memphis. And I remember him saying, son, you've got to, when you get out of high school, you should check out these foreclosure auctions. I think you can make money and to look at this real estate stuff. So he told me that I think it was my junior year or senior year in high school. And it wasn't, it wasn't long after he told me that I was already looking up the auctions schedules and stuff like that. And I remember going downtown just to be in front of the auctions. And the first auctions that I went to um, was during a school day. And so in that means school. I wasn't, yeah. Playing hooky and, to go buy houses. <laughs> yeah, and and if you saw my, I found my my report card the other day or whatever the transcript, and it shows yeah. the percentage of days missed, and it was like, I mean, it's embarrassing. I wouldn't want my kids to see it one day, but you know, it's yeah. like forty eight percent of days missed. And, but at least I was doing something productive with some of those days. So uh, you know, it's almost like a badge of honor, right? like an entrepreneur. I, I wouldn't want to tell my kids, show my kids that either, but. That's kind of like a badge of honor, especially like doing something productive, getting out there, getting such an early start with it. I love it, man. Yeah, and turning out okay. And and yep. Yep. and but I remember that day doing that. My dad always how does this revel relevant? You'll see. But my dad was always a fast driver and didn't care about uh, the traffic law. Okay, so right. any police officers, I'm sorry, don't don't pull him over. He's a nice guy. But <laughs> they pulled him over uh, recently before that auction, and. I remember being on the steps of the courthouse and the auctions going and I see something out of the corner of my eye and it's my father walking up the steps to go to his court date over his speeding ticket. <laughs> and you know, the first auction and then I run into him on a, on a school day. Um, I thought maybe he'd be upset and yeah. it turned out he was extremely proud and he was bragging right. all his friends about how, where he caught his son that day. That's that was a, 
huge confirmation. Like, dude, yeah. you're in the right spot. So yeah. that know. was my first. That's awesome, man. Did you end up buying anything or was this, did you have like a coach or anybody with you? Or are you just kind of making offers? What was, that's gotta be intimidating. So the first, the first couple of times, I, I don't know. I don't know anybody. Um, just showing up, seeing what's going on, how it works. And those two times, it was the same people each time, which come to find out every day of the week that there's an auction, that same crowd is going up there. Yeah. Some of them work together. Some of them work against each other. Regardless, it's the same competition every day. And if you line these guys up who have been doing it, real estate for years, investing for years. I remember one of the, one of the guys there had over 800 rental houses and, you know, and, you know, just, and it's not like some syndication fund either. Like there are 800 of his rental houses that he just keeps collecting at these auctions over the years. Yeah. And of course, when you first show up and you, you have a lawn mowing salary, like you feel a little bit intimidated and you feel like, okay, where do I even start? Or like, what are they even going to think when I, when I say my, my first bid or something like that. Um, but I ended up, I ended up meeting a guy there, uh, Greg Griffin. And I love this guy. I still talk to him. Super, super successful dude. Um, and in all kinds of different businesses, real estate's where he made his game, but, but he also grew up in Memphis and, and, you know, and probably a way more incredible story than, than what I've got as far as starting. I mean, because Memphis is a rough place, and he grew up in, in some of the, the darkest areas with the highest crime. I mean, like, it looks it looks terrible in these spots. Right. You don't want to go there without, Memphis, without – Memphis has got some tough tough neighborhoods. I've heard it that. is, and I'm, I'm proud to be from that spot. Yeah, um, sure. But at the same time, I can say that all day long, and it sounds like white noise compared to what – these guys have seen and where they grew up in the same yep. city. Yep. Um, but super proud and super happy to have met him because we sort of teamed up. He, he was born in 1985. I'm born in 1992. So he was like the closest to my age at the time. I'm, I guess, what am I? 17, 18. He's 24, 25. Right. Still, he's not, he's not like some loaded up rich guy, but he had a partner at the time, but we, we worked together and we would um, get some of these houses and, we would wholesale them. Uh, my first deals I did were, were buying them, and uh, he actually loaned me $29,100 without, without a contract, without anything. I, I still don't know why he did it. Um, handshake deal? Handshake deal. Then he rode with me to the bank right after that, and I got him the money. And, um, and yeah, we, I split that wholesale fee with him, and, and that was the first of many deals. And now, like, he's one of my favorite guys in my phone. Um, I love it. So this that's this how that started for twenty nine wholesaled it right away take your fee pay your pay your lender back pretty pretty yep. dry. And, and that was one of the few deals where they would make you pay up front so back then there was such an yeah. abundance of property at the time that you didn't have to even pay up front like you do now um, you could sweet talk them and with ninety percent of the trustees that were holding the auction they would give you twenty four hours to pay so you come to their office you drop them a check nice. off in twenty four hours and if you could build a relationship with these people that were in control of the, the deal, then you could really stretch that out. Oh, something came up today. So 48 hours. Oh, something came up one more day, 72 hours until you could actually find that buyer that's going to sell or to buy the property. And during those cases, I would have the buyers, I would say, look, uh, we've got a house here and I see that you're buying in the area, but we've got to close fast. You're going to get a killer deal on this. I saw you bought this one, one block away. This one's going to be, you know, 20% less than what you just paid for that. But I need you to close in three days. This is a, not a traditional closing. They would wire those funds to the trustee's account. The trustee would then cut me the check for the overage. So yep. if I won something for 29, I told the guy 39, then they would give me the 10 K back and made directly to me. And it, it was like no big deal. They were paying me my wholesale fee, the actual, uh, auction trustee. Yep. So you're buying these houses. I haven't done auction stuff, but you buying them sight unseen. You just buying addresses at that point and then going to check them out. I personally wasn't. No, I mean, like I'm, I'm too, I'm too conservative for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah I, I've got, to, I got to at least drive by, walk around, try the back door, see if it's open. And you know, enough times pass now that I, I shouldn't get in trouble for this. But you got to do what you got to do. Back back then, I mean, if it's vacant house and it needs work, and I know that I'm going to get it, or somebody's going to get it. And I want to get inside, and the only way to get inside is to, you know, maybe 
bust a hole out of the little glass in the back door, then maybe that's what we got to do. Or use a credit card to get in or whatever. I mean, if it's vacant, if somebody's living there, obviously I'm not going to do it, you know? Yes, and I don't, I don't mean that as a vandalism play because whoever's buying this property is going to go in there and rehab it anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it's an extra $20 worth of glass. You know, I'm not talking about busting the windows or anything like that. So, yeah, I naturally didn't feel comfortable without seeing as much as I could of the property. Of course. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. So that, you know, as a, as a kid of that age, getting a five, 10 K wholesale fee, that's real money, man. I mean, that's, it, that's it was, man. I felt good. Yeah. And I, I was a uh, surely stupid at the time. I mean, I would take it. And I mean, I, I remember buying, I remember bought, bought some Gucci work boots to get, wear out on the job. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And, <laughs> that's awesome. And, uh, Traveling here, traveling there, you know, buying a booth at the club, get all my friends in it. Just, just stupid stuff, you know. Um, blew all the money. Yep. But yeah. yeah. But some priceless memories, I'm sure. And when you're 80 looking back, you wouldn't trade it, I'm sure. So. No, no. And priceless lessons, too. Yeah, yeah, time and a place for that. So that was, did that turn into a pretty good um, – business for for a long time or did you get to a point where it wasn't scalable or what you know are you still doing that how did that progress honestly i wish i still was doing that in some sort of fashion just to add another arm of, on what we do but we're we're so yeah. busy right now with what we've got going on yeah. and, it, and it works and it's profitable and, and it's hard to keep your eye take your eye off the ball unless something you know everything's running perfect which i've got some room to to make that happen um, yep. so no, I'm not doing that anymore, but it did, that started in 2011 and I stopped that in 2012 or 13. And I'm, I know you're probably wondering like, why so quick would you stop that if you're making good money? But I like, you know, we talked about how rough Memphis was and as proud as I am of that place, I was still as a kid always wanted to get the hell out of there. So yeah. As soon as I felt like I had enough money, I remember I remember I looked at my bank account and I never made it to the hundred k back then. I I remember seeing my bank account. I was at a I was at a club at a party getting some money out of the ATM and I remember seeing the balance was at like ninety nine thousand six hundred something dollars, and I'm like, oh, I'm almost at a hundred. Yeah, never made it. I, I made it to negative five thousand before I ever made it to a hundred first. Right. right. Um, but a big part of that was because I thought I could do the same stuff in a city that I, I had all the connections that I could, I could have at, at, at a young age, uh, as much as I could. And a city that I knew like the back of my hand, I, I, I can close my eyes and just get you anywhere based off of a, a zip code. Sure. Um, and you know, going from there to Florida, which I always wanted to live in Florida, but so do a lot of other people. And when a lot of other people want to live there, that means that there's probably a lot more money there than there is in Memphis or places yeah. like, you know, Detroit or, you know, these other Baltimore. And anyways, I just thought I could do the same thing. Came down here and just tried and tried and tried um, to do these auctions, but they needed cash for everything. You know, in Memphis, I know I said 29,000, but hell, my first rental house that I bought was $7,200. And it's just like a different level. You don't find anything for $7,000 in, in Florida. Um, Gosh, even yeah. back then. And yeah. you know, it was just, it was just tough. So I, I did that and I had no options, um, to, but to make money. But so I got my real estate license and was actually a traditional type real estate agent half the time where I would take people around and show them property and write their contracts or whatever. Yep. Um, and then the other half, I was just trying to hustle and find that next deal that would make me a tick, a quick 10 K or a quick 50 K or something I could wholesale a package or whatever I could do. Um, which didn't work out in Florida, but it ended up leading me to the next, to the next step, um, that yep. brought me back to Memphis. Yep. So you're, you're doing the real estate. Would you advocate people do that? That are kind of breaking into the game. I get the question a lot, right? Should I get my license? Do you think that was helpful for you? You know, I think if, if you're going to get, if you're going to buy your own stuff, especially at first, I, I would totally recommend getting your own license. I hear a lot of people say, oh, don't get it. Rely on real estate agents. But I think if you look deep under the, the covers with that, like they probably own a real estate brokerage where they rely on their agents bringing in commissions. Okay. Right. But I personally think that having that license when you're going to invest, especially at the beginning is good because one, you get your commission back Two, you deal directly with 
the decision making either the either the uh, the broker on the other side or the uh, the seller, and yep. and they know that you're a professional even if it's your first deal. Um, on top of that, you get you get access to all you know the MLS. You can learn how all that stuff works, how the filters work, how listings work. You can you don't have to rely on someone else to show you new product. Um, yeah, definitely. You get the whole contract thing because everybody gets nervous with contracts. Like you know, I could do them in my sleep. Everything is pretty much templated, and you learn that, right. and, and you learn the phrases and the lingo and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I, I definitely would suggest people do that if they're going to be heavy in the game yeah maybe you don't do it forever but at the same time at the beginning while your volume is not to the max it's it definitely is beneficial i believe yeah no those are all really good really fair points and there's just so much to learn in the business and to do it before you start putting investment dollars in or raising other people's money i think i think it's oh yeah those are all fair points so today let's kind of fast forward to today what's the company look like what are you, what's you guys' primary focus? What's a, what's a week in the life look like for you now? Yeah, so um, today we've split up into well, not split up. We've I guess we've expanded into three different companies. <clears throat> so I've got you see this one on my shirt. This one's Brock One. So this is my construction company. Yep. Um, Brock One is you know fully licensed co- contracting company in the state of Florida that focuses yep. on building ground up construction, uh, single family homes and some small multifamily, whether it be duplexes or like townhome buildings, um, stuff like that. 99% of the product that is built by Brock one is either investor bought or kept by my second company, um, and used for rental purposes. Got it. Um, 1%, maybe it's a little higher than 1% goes to the retail market and really that's because i tried to keep our comps comps up on our appraisals it because it helps out the investors that are purchasing it helps yeah, them get right. walk into the deal with built-in equity it helps okay. their balance sheet out it helps the lending terms it helps everything um so there's that um and when i say rental property i don't mean to veer off or get too wordy here I know a lot of people think, my mind thinks of Memphis rental property and stuff, you know, cookie cutter, you know, rent, rental grade type product. Right. If you check us out and you look at the stuff that we build, it's completely sexy rental product. Like right. it's modern. It's, you know, quartz countertops, no carpet, high ceilings, all LED lighting, chandeliers and tile in the showers, with like actual designer look. Um not fiberglass stall. I mean, like you name it, I, I put a lot of energy and effort into the finishings on that. Yeah. Um, just so the investments can pay off for the long haul and it can attract great tenants with higher rent that want to stay longer. And if any of these investors include myself, which I don't see me wanting to do, uh, if anybody wants to sell the product in the future, it, it can outcompete any of the retail product on the marketplace in that area. So you're going to, you know, you're still going to stand out and people aren't going to be like, oh, I'm buying a rental house. So anyways, that's Brock one. That's one company. The second company is Holloman Capital Group. It's an investment company. Um, No outside funds in this company. Um, Just purely me and my family's, you know, income that we make off the businesses go into that and invest 100% into real estate that we build the same exact product in the same areas that we sell to other investors. Yep. Or some other, you know, investment trends. So, you know, not that not that a lot of people, you know, agree with this, but you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, we're, we're, we invest in this stuff. We even take percentages of our cash flow and turn it into Ethereum and Bitcoin every month from yep. the rental property. Yep. Um, you know, and then some some stocks we'll invest in, but it's all trendy type things. So, like when the Russian Ukraine war happened, we went we went into some defensive stocks and did pretty well, while the rest of the market didn't do anything. Yep. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's the second company. And then the third company is my new rental.com or my new rental, which it's on my, my water bottle here. Um, Sweet. So if anybody wants to see what we kind of build, you can go to my new rental.com. That's the property management company. So we manage everything in house. Um, it started with just my, my own investments that we managed. And then I had so many repeat clients that were buying product off of us and using other managers that they weren't happy with. They kept saying, man, Brock, please, please, please manage. I'm like, no, no, no. We finally opened it a year and a half ago, um, and it's going very well, too. So those are the three companies and the three things that we do here um, 
on the daily. I love it, man. Construction company, capital investment company, all internal. Love that, man. That that's awesome. And then you got to you got to manage them, right? Um, we kind of have a similar structure, across, you know, across the board. We're not we're not doing a lot of construction ourselves, but the management, the investment stuff, a lot of it in house. And you touched on it, but I want to ask, you know, that you hear a lot about built to rent, and I'm seeing more of it out there. I'm seeing people I know do it, um, and that. I like your philosophy. You're building a nicer product. Obviously, a pencil's for you guys, right? To go ahead and do nicer finishes out, or nicer finish outs, nicer construction and everything, rather than just kind of bare bones type deal. Yeah, it does. And, and not that it hasn't been difficult the last few years, of course. given where, where everything's at. Yeah. Um, it's been extremely difficult to make a pencil. But at the same time, when we put these nicer finishes in there, we our pro formos aren't we're not looking at just year one we're also we're expanding it out um on the unit turnover costs and everything like that the unit turnover costs are extremely low because of the way we we design these things you know like i said no carpet um we use an upgraded paint on the in, in, in on the exterior for sure because i know that's a that's a huge thing in florida like if you don't seal those block walls which again we do concrete instead of wood we could do wood it could be cheaper but we want our stuff to last and, and to, you know, be a better product and sellable in the future and appreciate. Um, you know, just a lot of different things that we do. The quartz countertops, the solid wood cabinets, they reduce the turnover costs when tenants move out, which really helps out our pockets and our investors' pockets. So, yeah, that, that side help, helps the pro forma out. But it has been difficult um, with rates where they're at and yeah. where rents had run way up and, you know, probably a little too high in some cases where now they've kind of fallen off, but rates are, uh, they are where they're at. So, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting time right now for sure. Um, but yeah, look, you know, if you're listening, go check out the gallery. I mean, it's some really cool looking projects. So that's something to be proud of where sometimes a single family rental portfolio, like you, you know, you're not that proud to like try by it, show it to your friends, but different, yeah. different, uh, different approach with you guys, real modern look, really clean. Um, you mentioned you're keeping most of them. I'm curious, just kind of as an entrepreneur, what, what is your, you know, what is your focus right now? Um, and where do you kind of like to spend most of your time and, and how do you kind of structure that to, to, to stay focused on the things that are most impactful for you? Yeah. Uh, so I, I wish I could do better in this, in this area. Yeah, you okay. Me, yeah. You and me both. Um, but I'll tell you the, the last year, um, really the last year and a half have been a big question mark as far as economy goes. Yep. And me growing up at that time, like I said, during the, the lawn mowing stuff, I only got to mow those lawns for the bank because the real estate market fell apart yep. and builders went broke because there was too much inventory. Yep. Are, are we there again right now? I don't think anywhere close. However, when you see that kind of stuff and you see all the, family, friends, and all the people that were in the industry growing up that used to have their boats and their fancy cars and this and their fancy houses, and then all of a sudden one day they're all bankrupt, it scars you as a, it scarred me um, yep. all these years. Like, I don't, I don't want to lose it, um, and I'll do anything I can to make sure that we don't, especially now that I'm, I'm like the, the honcho in charge and, like, my family relies on this stuff. I, I do not want to be those be the guys that, that I'm talking about that lost it all, got too overly confident. But at the same time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to scale back everything and, and just go no activity. Um, so last year we did about a hundred houses the year before we did two, like close to 200. So I scaled back volume, um, and probably shouldn't have last year, but this year we are acting more aggressive, but what have we been working on? I've been super into the system side of things. So making yeah. sure that we've got, you know, checklists that, because we, we got checklists out the wazoo, okay? And that's how we build so efficiently and, and fast, too, because our average build time in Central Florida is like 68 days. Our average build time down in South Florida, which is unheard of, is like 115, 120 days. We're still trying to capture that. Um, but but house in 68 days, huh? Yeah, and that's that's our average as we've grown. And before, like when, when it was actually me running a job or – me and my father running a job or him running a job. I mean, dude, we could do some incredible stuff. I've built them. I've built some in, in like four weeks. It's, it's, it's insane. And it was just like a game 
when you don't have that much money and you're you're only limited to build what you can at, at that given time, because I didn't used to have any construction loans, the only way to make money make more money is to do it faster. So it was like, yeah. let's do it faster, faster, faster. Beat the old record, beat the old record. So yeah, and you can do that with systems in 68 days. It feels like a long, a lifetime compared to 28 days. But when when you're scaling it out and you've got project managers that are running it, that, it, that it's not their company, it's, it's, and you can still achieve those numbers. It's, it's incredible, incredible, incredibly successful, you know, statistic, I think. Um, but yeah, so there's whole, all these other different facets on the, on these businesses that work hand in hand. Cause these three, they're like three spokes in a wheel. And if everything can sort of turn perfectly, then everything can run like a well-oiled machine. So that's been my main focus is making sure that all these systems and CRMs and software that we use all talk to each other and it runs like clockwork. Yeah. So I've really doubled down on my time like that. And this year, especially it's like the first month and a half have just flown by. Cause I've, I've literally spent every night, uh, doing this stuff and, and not that I'm like a control freak, because I know I should be de delegating this stuff out too. But it's it's extremely del uh, hard to delegate this this system side out until I got the foundation built, because um, nobody really knows how you want the system to work. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you have to build it yourself. I mean, it it will be the mechanism that the delegation happens through, but to the building of it, the architecture, that's got to be you, right? I'm glad you told me that, Devin, because everybody around me, they're like, just hire someone, just hire someone. But, you know, I've, I've hired and fired, I think, like seven or eight people at that job. And, and it's like nobody cares. Nobody understands all three businesses and how they work. And nobody knows in my brain. Nobody can read my mind and say, oh, this is how he wants it to work. But, That's right. You could hire a consultant, pay him six figures for the rest of your life, and they'd be happy to come along and tinker with it. But, you know. Yeah, I, I struggle with that a lot, and that's, you know. So do you think once the foundation is built that it's smart to then hire somebody to come in and just maintain it or add features? Like once the, everything's, you know, the, the main part's in. What do yeah, you think well, on that? For, for me, where I'm at, you know, we've got a team of 75 folks and software systems. I'm, st I'm still kind of like the CRM admin, you know, because to your point, I just like, man, I've got all these things. I know exactly how I want them. I don't want to sit in committees or meetings. I just want to build it and then hand it off and go, this is how it works. You know, and then somebody can do the task or the process 1000 times within that framework. But my philosophy is, or just experience, I want to build that framework, you know? And so I just hadn't been able, I, I want to, I, like you, man, I want to hand this off to somebody, yeah. but it, there's, you know, there's things you can hand off and there's things that you just hold back on. Just, they're just too critical. Right. Yeah, uh, I've been saying I'm, I'm so close for like a year. Yeah, I, I know. Like every day, I'm, oh, I'm so close, I'm so close. But I really am the close this time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's always that way. Man, you guys do, doing 100 to 200 houses, and you're keeping most of them and just throwing them over the property management company? No. That, now, when the rates were low, yeah, and, and it was like values have went up 10% since, since two months ago when we yeah, started it, Right. it was easy to keep most of them. Yeah. But last year, last year, our, our keep rate went way down, sure. way down. The, the sure. year before we were really close to 50, 50. Yeah. This last year, we only kept like six or 7%. And oh, wow. Okay. I just had to keep, but, but at the same time we doubled our team and I needed to, I needed to throw more money back into that construction side of the yep. business yep. instead of the, the other side. Um, even though we cut our production, we doubled the team. But we also improved our system so more people can run those, as you know, like, you know, different areas of the system and be responsible. So we, when we are ready to ramp back up, which we're starting to now, then yep. things will ramp it up in a more organized manner that doesn't uh, need and require Brock to be there on every damn thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Isn't that the eternal kind of entrepreneurial challenge, especially as you grow? What are some of your favorite systems? You mind talking kind of software and systems here? I love, I love getting into that stuff. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I've built, uh, I, I tried to build stuff on top of uh, Asana and Trello and a couple, I forgot a couple other things. And I spent so much time doing this stuff and it was like super buggy to me. And yep. let's see, I tried to do pipe drive that sucked. To me, it sucked. I, and some people might say, oh, this is the best thing ever. I fell in love, and there's more that I tried and I failed, but I fell in love with Salesforce. Yeah. Um, I think Salesforce, I hear a lot of people talk crap about it, but 
I think it's the coolest CRM out there that allows you to really just anything you want to do. It's like you're, you're coding your own system to work yep. exactly how you want it to work. And I, I just find it, I find it very easy to operate. Um, and although I have, I've got a ton of challenges with, um, setting up some of the flows and some of the ways that, that things need, need to happen on there. Um, once I do figure them out, everything works beautifully. The dashboards and I mean, it's just awesome. It'll connect to QuickBooks. It'll connect to, to everything you want. Um, except a few of the things like Appfolio doesn't connect to, which is, you know, don't get me started on Appfolio. We, we use Appfolio for our prop, property management, yeah. which that was a, you know, it is what it is. A lot of big companies use it. A lot of companies bigger than us, but I don't like it. No, nah. but it's like, you know, it t pick your poison, right? I mean, you got a yeah. third party property management software. You don't build your own. Appfolio is missing this. So you switch to the other one and it's missing this other. I mean, none of them are perfect. That's for sure. Yeah, so I figured we'd just stay with that polio for a couple of years, and then either they're going to come out with the stuff that we need, or we'll switch yep. to Yardy, and they'll come out with everything. I don't know. I yep. have no idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but it would be great if App Folio. It's like they they lock you in a, a jail cell and don't let you, you know, let your App Folio system speak to any of your other softwares. Right. I mean, yeah. Like QuickBooks, that that side doesn't work great. I don't think it, it should. Any of these. Uh, software systems, if they want to compete in the real world, they should have an integration before they even launch with Salesforce. I yep. think Salesforce is used by so many major companies out there that if you don't do that, you're, it's very stupid. Um, Just talk to Salesforce. They're the 800 pound gorilla. Make it work, it, right? It, it, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And, but I, I would, I'm going to put this on Outfolio. I think it's their fault, just because they're so crappy at a lot of other things. But <laughs> we use Builder Trend for our construction sure. um, software. Yep. yep. Um, which, when we started them, it was they were sort of a new company. They've come a long way. They've got a lot of cool features on there. Their uh, their their system operates pretty poorly with QuickBooks the way we use it. Um, so we can't let that we can't let them two talk to each other. Um, but, you know, they did start in the last couple of weeks. They actually started a Salesforce integration, which I'm so happy about. Cool. Yeah. Because right now we're just having Builder Trend talk to like an email parser that then goes to Zapier and then goes to update Salesforce. And it's it still has – it'll be buggy one out of 100 times. So it's it kind of sucks. But super excited about that. Um, yeah, I know that we use some other systems. I'm just thinking. Are you, uh, you know, did did are you have an IT sort of inclination, or you just learn this stuff because you had to because you're an entrepreneur? Oh, that's exactly all it was. I yep. mean, everybody's like, oh, I don't know how to do it. Okay, you're like, dude, Google. I, did, I barely got out of high school, man. You go to YouTube. I can learn anything on YouTube. Yep. Anything. Yep. Like I didn't know anything about rentals before I listened. To Back when I was doing my first real estate stuff for the first seven years until I was 25, I'm like, I'm like, rentals are stupid. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend all my money and then I'm going to make 150 bucks a month. How am I going to get rich like that? Right. But when you actually dig in, you're like, okay, I don't pay taxes. If I buy a rental, yep. all that income's tax free. I can go get loans. I can cash flow. You know, I can go refinance and you know, all that kind of, and my net worth goes up and I get paid while I sleep. You know, you live and you learn. Um, but, but yeah, that was one big thing. Like, I definitely didn't grow up with a tech background. Dude. That was the last thing that my family knew about was tech. Uh, I think it's good for people to hear that. And it, it's, it, it's kind of the difference between that owner mentality where you're just going to run through walls. And it's like, man, anything you want to know, especially right now, you can – accounting, programming, IT, whatever, marketing. Yeah, it's, it's and when you're an owner, you, you act like your head's about to be chopped off if you don't, if you don't learn it. And then yep. you pick it up. Yep, that's and that's it. that's the difference. Yeah. Yep, that's the difference. What do you guys see? We're talking in Jan uh, February 2024. What do y'all kind of see on the horizon here? Is what you're doing really dependent on where the Fed sets rates, or you know, what's kind of your game plan for the next year, at least as it stands right now? If we were in one of those colder markets that you don't hear on the news every day, yeah. um, I think we would be a lot more um, relying on. We're going to, you know, be really slow until rates come down. Yeah. There's we, with us dealing with investors. I think a lot there's I mean, I'm, there's no lie. A bunch of investors are definitely turned off right now. Sure. But my best investments and best payouts, not just real estate, have always come by 
purchasing when everybody is too afraid to buy. Yeah. Um, so I think whoever does buy now is doing doing themselves a great service because the, you see there's a, a ton of pent up demand. Like that phrase was used a lot over the last five years, but a lot of pent up demand right now, I think in real estate where they're waiting on rates to come back into a level that, that, that are, you know, two and a half percent, which does that happen? Eventually I'm sure it will just because you look at the historical chart, but will it happen this year? No way. I don't think it will. I mean, right. it could unless something super tragic happens, which it could in the commercial space. But, um, sure. I mean, it might be right now. Who knows? But, uh, you know, with that being said, like whoever buys now, when that, when those rates do come down, it's going to be floodgates opening of people and it's going to be bidding wars again. And you can always refinance at that time. Um, so are we slower now than we were a couple of years ago? Yeah. But, do are we do we have enough traffic to sell all of our inventory or that we want to sell? Yes. Um, if we go if we went full retail, would we still have traffic? Absolutely. I mean, we've got our offices are like model homes, even though we're, we're do build to rent. They're right next to like Dr. Horton, LGI, and Miranda, and all these other public publicly traded companies, and they do great retail right now, even in this market. Um, but I, I I see sort of a slow stagnant and wait mentality yeah, in all of the real estate and investing space until, sure. until the dust settles and, and there's more confidence in the air, I think. And I hate to be political, but from a political standpoint too, of in course. this country, yeah, because um, you see Joe Biden take the podium. It's not like all the investors get super confident and they're ready to go invest. So hard to watch. So yeah. I mean, when Trump was on there, love him or hate him, when he's on and we've got we've got the news on in our office all day long, like he comes on. I actually, I would quit work and I'm like, let me listen, because it's like motivating. Right. We're, we're going to do great things. We're going to you're going to be the best ever. And, you know, you're going to make so much money. And, <laughs> and everybody is a country. Yeah. When they hear this stuff, they feel confident. Their their blood starts pumping. Their energy level gets up. They're ready to go invest. They're ready to spend money. They're ready to work harder. I mean, and I just feel like we're way better off as a country when when that's the case. And I, I, I truly believe that that's coming back. And I think when it does, I think floodgates start to open again, regardless of interest rates. But I do know that that man would hammer the Fed chair every day about interest rates being too high, even when they're <laughs> down. It's like, it, it's not fair. Obama had zero. They were close to zero rates and <laughs> they don't like Trump. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, uh, I think yeah. all this stuff helps us going into 25. That's why I'm, I'm investing more now. I'm trying to get ahead of that. So, yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, well, look, the Fed, you know, the, the debt service for the federal debt is, you know, that alone right there is kind of going to put pressure on interest rates long term. But, yeah, I think we're seeing the same thing. Like we've had some good buys on some deals that like kind of got to hold my nose on the interest rate. But I'm like, man, this, this is a really good basis on this deal. You know, in two, three years, this thing's going to gonna shoot up scream you know so it's like uh and there's just so much hesitation and fear out there understandably but it's like man if you can get you lock in your basis that rate's not forever so we're, we're definitely we're definitely seeing some of that i want uh, badly to be in the multifamily game right now i wish that's why i had more energy to focus on because i think that is the biggest opportunity for this year is to to get some multifamily just like you said if even if the numbers don't pencil out great on the cash flow if you can scoop some of these deals up at the current cap rates, I mean, you look at cap rates two, three years ago that were half of what they are now. Right. That alone, rents don't even have to go up a penny. And we're talking double, double the value, which if you yeah. put 25% down, that's a, that's a 4X on your, your money. So, right. dude, I, I wish I had the energy to put or the time to put into this right now because – that's the space to kill it this year, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think we've, we've kind of always been in multifamily, and we kind of go, we keep buying through thick and thin, um, and have, you know, that's kind of the core of our portfolio. But uh, to, at the same time, you got something that's working. You got the machine built. A lot to be said for just, you know, charging ahead with something that's that's already working. Um, if you're going back talking to a young entrepreneur, you know, what are you telling them uh, um, from your vantage point now if they're just getting started out? Um, entrepreneurs in, in general, just, just, uh, keep fighting and keep working outwork everybody around you. Because when, when the, when everybody leaves the office, 
that's actually the time to double down and get more stuff done, especially yeah. in your early stages. Because yep. when people are at the office, or who, even if you don't, you're not even big enough to have an office yet. Um, when you're making calls and you're doing activities that are that are going to progress your business, that is going to take up your time. And but it's only going to take up your time when other people are are awake and doing business. Not everybody's doing this thing at night. But if you can continually outwork everybody and put more time and energy in, then you can take three steps at, for every step that everybody else is taking, and you can elevate your your business quicker. And then on the real estate entrepreneur side, don't sell anything. Just figure out how to keep as much as you can. Love it. Listen to that, folks. Write it down, kids. Those are wise words. Um, Brock, this has been awesome getting to know you and your, your business and your companies. I love it. Love talking to fellow entrepreneurs, people that are brave enough to go out there and make it happen. Um, if somebody listening wants to connect and learn more about what you guys are doing, where do we send them? Yeah, so uh, we just started, or I just started up on, on Instagram and social media. I'm trying my best, but with all the work that we got going on or I got going on, it's hard for me to get in there yeah. um, all the time. Yep. But I am on there. I'm constantly answering messages. We're, we're shooting videos and stuff to, to try to promote things like that. But please go out there and, and follow me on Instagram, man. My, it's at follow.brock. So at follow.brock. Um, weirdly enough, someone stole at Brock Holloman. Um, but anyway... <laughs> That's where you can find me on social and hit me up there. Also, Facebook, same tagline. Uh, I'm not on there as much, but my team is. TikTok, same thing. Um, but, you know, also check out my website, like you said earlier, mynewrental.com. Just look at our product, and if you want to tell me how good it looks, you can still drop me that message on Instagram. I'd love that, and it'd make me feel good. Not and, be uh, mad about that. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. We'll link to that in the show notes. If you're listening, you can scroll through, click through the website or click through the Instagram. Uh, Brock, this has been great, man. I'm kind of fired up to go tweak some systems things in, in my companies, but I appreciate you spending time and wish you success here in the year ahead. Thanks, Devin. It's been great for me too. All right. Talk to you soon. You. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.